I'm Ashton Addison from Event Chain for Investment Pitch Media and FinTech News Network. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Vinny Lingham, the co-founder and CEO of Civic. Vinny, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Ashton, great to be here. Thank you. You're very welcome. Can we kick it off with a little bit on your background and how you first got involved in cryptocurrencies and, and how you started Civic? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those zero entrepreneurs, always doing the, the, the next big thing. <laughs> always, that's what I kind of... Uh, characterize myself. And so I, I was in the search engine market back in 2001, you know, right? When it just started. Um, I was doing search engine marketing, started my own company in 2003, sold it in 2007, started a software as a service business in 2007, um, left that in 2011, started a, a mobile payments company in 2012, which was Gift. Uh, you know, raised a bunch of money, like five million bucks, sold it two years later for like 50, 54 million bucks to First Data Corporation. And, um, you know, and in that, that experience is interesting because we learned how to deal with credit card fraud. And one of the ways we did that was using cryptocurrency, which was at the time only Bitcoin. And um, we were one of the biggest Bitcoin sellers online because gift cards had a high fraud rate online, but, but Bitcoin solved the credit card fraud problem. So that's how I got into the space. And then, you know, after that, I decided to leave and start up um, a company called Civic, which um, was the idea of you know, putting identity on the blockchain. Uh, using you know, cryptographic proofs and keys. Um, I've been working on that ever since. So that's been you know, nearly five years now. And uh, you know, obviously the space is, has been pretty chaotic, but we're, we're still standing, we're, we're making it work. Definitely, yeah. Well, let's dive a little bit deeper into Civic. You know, you're providing private digital identities. Uh, now there is a fundamental shift happening, especially in these crazy times, in the way that we are controlling and releasing our private information. How exactly are, you know, is innovation through blockchain-based digital identities helping protect our privacy more than ever now? You know, um, the innovation is there in, in spades. I mean, there's so much tech we can use now to protect identity. The reality is that the incentives to do it are just very low. I mean, we're building consumer products like the wallet, which you can store cryptocurrency on, uh, and that has your identity tied to it. But... You know, the bigger companies that need identity, they want your identity, they want to keep your information, they want to profile you. And what I try to explain to people is identity is one of those sad things where individually your identity is worthless to a big company. They don't care about you specifically. They don't care about Ashton or Vinny or anyone else. But collectively, it's extremely valuable for them to have all these identities clumped together. So it's difficult to say it's my identity, it's worth money. It's actually worthless. It's like worth 20 bucks or whatever. But as a collective... We're giving these guys the ability to use our identity information and basically make billions out of it. Um, so, you know, sure, we get some free services out of it, but at what point are we giving away too much of our privacy? Um, the reality is big companies are not going to change the way they do business because they just there's no legal reason for them to. Mm -hmm. And they're going to build services that consumers want. And the majority of consumers don't care about the identity and how it's used. It's a, it's a real vocal minority that cares and therefore... We don't change the path of, of privacy protection as a vocal minority. Um, that said, I think with the advent of COVID-19, there is more uh, going on in the digital identity space now than, you know, than even a year ago or six months ago, because touching you know, an ID, a driver's license, a, you know, a passport, like now you have the COVID-19 risk. And so you know, let's see how it plays out in the next three to six months. But I, I, I think that digital identities may have been accelerated as a result of this virus. But Def for, for different for biological reasons as opposed to, you know, um, regulatory ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting how a lot of people don't really care uh, about their personal privacy, or at least they don't really think about it when they just register for everything. And it seems that every free application, as long as you give your information to them, you can access anything you want very conveniently. So we often give up our information right away. But Correct. interestingly enough, in the blockchain industry, it seems that, or at least the perception from outsiders is that people are attracted to cryptocurrencies, or at least some people are attracted to them because of the anonymity surrounding that. Now, do you feel that identity uh, specifically tied to cryptocurrency transactions or platforms that use smart contracts and integrate with blockchain? Is identity a very important factor in growing the blockchain industry? Um, yes, it, it obviously is. I think we're already in the semantic weeds here around how is it managed, how is it transferred, how is it digitized, etc. And that's a difficult part. How do you make it simple and trustworthy? Um, 
you know, right now what happens is when you, when you go to a new service, a new exchange, a new website, they want to fully verify you every single time. There's no reusable digital identity credential that can be moved around. And that's the problem right now is you have to go through these hoops every single time. And there is no service out there that's, that's made it really easy and simple to do it. So, so we're trying to do that. We're trying to make it simple and easy. But it's a challenge because I think most companies, until there's a network effect in one service, most companies are like, well, we integrated Civic. They only have X number of 100,000 users. It's not enough. We're signing up millions a year. We, you know, we can't leverage it. If we had 100 million users, it'd be a different story. But so, mm-hmm. so I think the question is like, how do you, how do you really get to, to critical mass with digital identity so that, that other companies can just tap into the identity ecosystem? And you know, there's a number of working groups out there. We've got a number of industry bodies, the DIF, et cetera, uh, mm-hmm. that are trying to create standards for identity. But all the identity players are all subscale, and getting to scale is tough. Um, and the, 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 there's a bit of a conundrum. Like the big players can't get to scale purely because the big players, and uh, you know, Facebook's not going to give their data of identity over to Google. Google's not going to give it to Apple. Apple mm-hmm. you know, is not going to share stuff. So how do you how do you get to critical mass without becoming a big player? I, I don't know the answer. I'm just saying this is this is the problem. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. And the fact that you touched on you know the bio. Uh, the, the biological factor and the biometrics uh, surrounding touching uh, IDs and because of this COVID-19 situation seems to likely be in your favor for private digital identities. Now, do you, do you see biometrics still being integrated, at least you know, with Civic? Is there a plan to integrate biometrics as well into your digital identity so it actually has your physical DNA you know, attached to well, that? Well, I wouldn't say DNA, but we, we do facial recognition right now, and that's good enough. Yeah. Okay. Great. And do you see that uh, being enough for you know the time being? Um, we we think so. I think uh, obviously the, the space will evolve, the technology will evolve and improve. But for now, that's good enough. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting about Civic is you have the identity system, but you also have the payment solution and the wallets, uh, mm-hmm. where you can send and receive payments, and you have an insurance policy as well, which is great to see uh, on the cryptocurrency side. Can you talk about the importance of combining? the identity system with the wallet infrastructure? Sure. So we think that what makes what makes this powerful is that we can offer something which previously wasn't available. So it's a million dollars insurance policy that you get offered to store your crypto in our wallet. If you lose your if you lose your wallet, your phone, your, your, your whatever, backups, we can still recover that money for you. And that's backed by a million dollar insurance policy, which is only possible because we can link your identity to your crypto coins. Mm-hmm. And we can help restore it, knowing that we can revalidate your identity, approve it to you, and get your coins back. So it's it's part of, it's part and parcel of, of a better better offering for consumers. We think. Yeah, definitely. And you know, there's been a lot of people that have been not a lot of people, but there have been hacks where people have lost their crypto or they just lose their hard drive and you know goes to the dumpster. And and how do you really prove that you were the one who owned those coins, right? Exactly. Yeah, so that's super interesting. Well, right now the wallet is in private beta. Uh, can you talk about when is the big launch and what does the upcoming roadmap look like leading into the launch? I think we'll be we'll be public and launch in the next uh, thirty days. So mm-hmm. it'll be open to everyone. It's in the the, the wait list right now is like a hundred thousand people. We'll be, we're onboarding a couple thousand every day, so we should be through that by the end of June. So by the end of June, this should be publicly available to everyone, which would be fantastic. That's great, and. What would you say is the biggest obstacle or limitation in front of you in terms of getting that adoption into the millions and millions of users? Um, I, I think it's a function of, of time um, and a bit of luck, right? Like most startups need a bit of luck, like you know, good luck in the mm-hmm. sense that, you know, are, are there needs, like when you start a company, you have this vision and this determination to build something. But if you mistime the market, mm-hmm. you know the company fails. If you yeah. if you're too early or you're too late, you know, the company doesn't it fails. It doesn't work. If you get it just right, and that takes a little bit of skill and a lot of luck, you have an explosive success. So we don't know what that luck factor is. Does the world go into a COVID nineteen post COVID nineteen crisis where digital ID becomes critical and everyone starts focusing on that? Um, you know, for restaurants to reopen, do we need to have, like, we don't know what the impact of the vaccine is going to be, right? A vaccine mm-hmm. comes up. Now, are we going to have a situation where only vaccinated people can go into certain places, restaurants, events, mm-hmm. etc.? If that's the case, then you need a digital identity to prove that you're the one who received the vaccine. Like, uh, it's, it's so hard to predict how this is going to play out. But if we're lucky, 
it plays out in our favor and digital identity wins. Definitely. And I know you've done a lot more outside of cryptocurrency as well with entrepreneurship uh, and learning from mentors in startups with entrepreneurs is especially important right now because of this crazy coronavirus pandemic. And I know that you authored uh, a book on advice for entrepreneurs um, and co-authored it. Okay, great. And I'm guessing that that probably didn't have, you know, the the chance of a pandemic and what to do during a pandemic in the book. (laughs) But if you had uh, to make updates to that book, what kind of advice would you give to entrepreneurs now that are looking to build their businesses throughout this pandemic? So there's two types of entrepreneurs. Startups, where the company isn't pro- profitable and you you um, you need to you know, find product market fit and scale a business. And then existing businesses like restauranteurs, take- takeaways, food businesses, consult business. So let's talk about profitable business and startup businesses, two separate businesses, right? Great. So if you were profitable pre-COVID-19 and you could go back in time, what would you have done differently? And the answer probably is if you're in, if you're in a tough sp- spot right now, you probably would have put away 5% a month in, of your savings if you could. Cut your costs down mm-hmm. and work towards you know, profitability of and savings of around 5% of your monthly expenses. Or rather, you know, it you know, depends on what you, but let's say 5 to 10% depending on, on the scale of your business. You want to have a war chest of 18 months cash in the bank at any mm-hmm. point in time. And that's personal and business wise. And people want to know like, why is Apple and Google and Facebook, why are they so like powerful and strong during such a downturn? Because they're sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars in cash. They don't yeah. pay it out to shareholders. They don't like, it's just cash on mm-hmm. the balance sheet. So when big companies are doing that and they, and they can weather any storm as a result, there's no reason why smaller companies shouldn't be doing the same thing on a smaller mm-hmm. scale. And I think having cash reserves is something that, you know, if anything, COVID-19 teaches us that there are certain things that are just totally outside our control that can happen. And if that happens, you should be, you should be totally putting down, um, uh, you know, you should have enough savings to back you up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting and great advice. And it's interesting because they we see from the stats that a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck and don't really have that emergency fund or reserve fund. But at the same time, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses seemed like they were also doing the same. You'd think that they would be you know, running and be able to hold themselves for a few months. But it, we saw most of them go out of business immediately right after the pandemic had started. Isn't that really interesting? After like a month or two, yeah. Like ima- imagine you had eighteen months capital in the bank, and you're like, "Well, you know, I can just I can just shut down the store for six months, take a vacation, and come back, and I still have a year's worth of capital in the bank." Like that's a powerful thing, right? And I think a lot of businesses probably would have needed that buffer more than others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time, but what is the best way for viewers to learn more about the Civic update when the wallet's coming out and get involved with Civic? Uh, go to civic.com, follow us on Twitter at Civic Key or myself at Vinny Lingham. Um, and uh, yeah, go to the website, sign up for the waitlist. We'll send you an invite when it's opened up or your turn comes up and take it from there. Sounds great, Vinny. Thank you so much. I'll leave those links in the description box below. All the best with the Civic launch and let's follow up in the near future. Thanks, Ashton. Take care. All the best.